Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It's terrific to see friends who were here in former years welcome back, as well as colleagues here presently. Um, though I feel a bit guilty to have brought you in here on such a gorgeous day, so it's like we've taken you out of the light of the sun and brought you back into the cave. I apologize, um, but I, this should be fun. Um, I'm going to introduce myself and my colleague, Angelos Haniotis. I said Angelos, sorry, Angelos Haniotis. He's very generous in uh, letting people mash up his name. I apologize. Um, who are going to spend the next two hours with you talking about the relevance of antiquity to thinking about politics in the present. Um, and so let me first tell you a little bit about Angelos um, before I begin. He joined us here at IAS this year. Um, having come most immediately from All Souls in Oxford, where he had been since 2006, I want to say, is that right? 2006. Uh, previously, he'd been at Heidelberg, uh, where he had begun as an assistant professor and uh, stayed there but for an interim at NYU, uh, so that he was professor and chair of the Department of Ancient History from 1998 to 2006, serving as well while there as vice rector for international relations. Um, and over the course of that time, a uh, career obviously distinguished in its appointments, he has published remarkably productively and prodigiously in all kinds of areas of ancient history, um, religion, economy, questions of war and power. He has also been a guiding force in the continued production of the important volumes and epigraphy in the field, and has consistently in his work combined the epigraphist's most careful attention to the particularity of ancient historical experience with broad concern for questions of social organization and political form. So he'll share that expertise with us this afternoon, and we're delighted to have him here at the Institute. It's a terrific appointment for the School of Historical Studies. Um, I'm Danielle Allen. I'm the UPS Foundation Professor in the School of Social Science. I joined the Institute in the 2007-2008 academic year. And my primary areas are political philosophy and the history and theory of democracy. So we'll be coming at questions of the relevance of antiquity to the present from two different, the two different ends of the question, basically. I'm going to begin, we're each going to speak uh, for about half an hour and then uh, join together in a conversation with all of you. Um, so I'll go first and then Angelos after me. Um, I was going to uh, initiate the conversation by taking you into work I'm doing now on a very contemporary question, um, but for which work antiquity is helpful to me. And so I wanted to essentially give you a case study. Um, here's one person trying to think about contemporary political questions and drawing on the resources of the past to do so. Is this useful or not? I think the framing question for any conversation about the relevance of antiquity to politics in the present is whether or not the use of antiquity, um, the belief that it's relevant, is a matter of accident or necessity. That is, do we continue to think about the Greeks and Romans simply because for centuries people have done so and that it's an accident of tradition? Or is there something intrinsic to the Greek and Roman experience and non-substitutable such that when one draws on those resources, one is able to do work in thinking about politics that can't otherwise be done? That, I think, is the overarching question. And uh, look forward to jumping into it with all of you. So um, anonymity and civility, political discourse in the internet age. Um, I've been recently trying to think about how to think about the public sphere in the context of the internet. And in order to do that, one has to begin by starting with the concept of the public sphere. So I want to give you just two examples of 20th century philosophers who have paid attention to that concept. Hannah Arendt, the term public signifies two closely interrelated but not altogether identical phenomena. It means first that everything that appears in public can be seen and heard by everybody and has the widest possible publicity. For us, appearance, something that is being seen and heard by others as well as by ourselves, constitutes reality. Compared with the reality which comes from being seen and heard, even the greatest forces of intimate life, the passions of the heart, the thoughts of the mind, the delights of the senses, lead an uncertain, shadowy kind of existence, unless and until they are transformed, deprivatized and deindividualized, as it were, into a shape to fit them for public appearance. 
Second, the term public signifies the world itself insofar as it is common to all of us and distinguished from our own private place in it. Such a common world can survive the coming and going of the generations only to the extent that it appears in public. It is the publicity of the public realm which can absorb and make shine through the centuries whatever men may want to save from the natural ruin of time. Jürgen Habermas took up Arendt's definition of the public almost exactly, essentially paraphrasing it in the structural transformation of the public sphere, though not acknowledging the fact that he was doing so. Um, but he was at least straightforward enough about what he was doing that he identified Arendt's reliance on Greek categories. So he wrote, we are dealing with categories of Greek origin transmitted to us bearing a Roman stamp. In the fully developed Greek city-state, the public life, the bios politikos, went on in the marketplace. But of course, this did not mean that it occurred necessarily only in this specific locale. The public sphere was constituted in discussion, or lexis, which could also assume the forms of consultation and of sitting in the court of law, as well as in common action, or praxis, be it the waging of war or competition in athletic games. So a scholar who wants to think about the public sphere in the contemporary context when turning to the resources of philosophy is immediately met with the resources of antiquity. We have an idea of the public sphere. Theoretically, that idea is Greek in its origin, but with a Roman stamp. That idea focuses on speech in particular. So the public sphere is constituted in a particular kind of speech, too, in Habermas's argument in particular, goes on essentially to a notion of deliberation. So this is the speech of named individuals directly confronting each other, disagreeing, but working ultimately to a consensus. So this is a picture from the US Constitutional Convention, which you probably recognized. Um, so it's not, it's you recognize this. I gave a similar lecture to undergraduates at USC, and none of them recognize this picture. But in our contemporary world, that picture of the public sphere, that picture of reasoned deliberation, seems not actually to capture our experience. This is a trivial example, but a little a blog post uh, by the mother of an athlete uh, who spent too much time reading the blogs about her son. Right? So she said, I read with growing shock the mean-spirited opinions among this unnamed community. And she thought, well, maybe I'm just a mother and I'm a little too involved here, so perhaps I'm just getting one slice of the world of the internet. Maybe this doesn't really represent political or discourse generally now. So she looked at other kinds of blogs and her, uh, her review led her to the conclusion that all kinds of blogs are marked with this sort of incivil discourse. Political blogs, celebrity blogs, literary blogs, and even mommy blogs. <laughs> um, so how, given the image of the public sphere that philosophers like Hannah Arendt and Jürgen Habermas give us, are we to think about the prevalence of incivil discourse in the contemporary world? Uh, let's see, oops, wrong direction. Uh, let me just um, expand the examples from the trivial to the more significant. Um, you'll remember the email that circulated about Barack Obama in the last election, um, alleging that he is a Muslim who's hiding the fact that he's Muslim. Um, it begins, be careful, be very, very careful. Um, that had important consequences. It did, in fact, move poll numbers and move public opinion. So just to remind you of how numbers changed over time, um, from March 2009, just after uh, the election, um, to the present, you can see the, the numbers who think that Obama is uh, Muslim have gone up from 11% to 18%. Um, but even at the point of, so March 2009, it's just after the inauguration, that 11% was a number that had already been moved up from about 5 or 6% the previous year. Um, so the email circulated starting even before Obama had announced his run for the presidency, and it has had a significant effect on public opinion. So one then is forced to think, well, we can't just think of this incivil discourse as trivial. It's moving numbers, opinion, in ways that move the other levers of our political system. This uh, is a video from the protests after the Iranian Revolution, the death of Neda uh, Aga Sultan, I believe her name is, which was taken anonymously and circulated around the world. It helped inspire the protest in Iran against the regime and draw public attention globally to uh, the events in Iran. So I present this as an example, a counter example of an element of anonymous discourse circulating on the web now, which one has to think of as positive, essentially, uh, functions as the dis discourse of a whistleblower. So anonymity is not straightforward. Like every other form of speech, uh, see, it's good and bad, right? It can be true or false. 
It can emerge uh, out of matters of principle or it can be directed in an ad hominem way. So we still have the problem of, in our contemporary public sphere, how to think about at the specificity of anonymity. And it's at this point that, again, I found ancient materials useful. So just as uh, I began with a concept of the public sphere, which had um, ancient origins, and found that that concept of the public sphere didn't really help me understand our current situation, I then found that it was by going back, actually, to the material out of which people had constructed that original notion of the public sphere, that it could begin to see some other features of a public sphere that we might want to draw attention to. So the particular ancient resource I turned back to was Sophocles' Antigone. Um, so we'll talk about this in a second, but let me just remind everybody of the plot uh, of the Antigone. I'm sure you generally know it, but at any rate, uh, after the death of Oedipus, his two sons, Polynices and Eteocles, agree to share rule in the city of Thebes. Each is supposed to take a turn for a year, but after a year, Eteocles is not willing to give up the throne, and so Polynices attacks the city. So I always like to use this as an example that nobody should hold up brotherly love as the model of what we need in politics, right? Because here are two brothers, the original example of sibling rivalry. Um, they fight over their city and kill each other in the battle. And so then the new king of Thebes, Creon, who is their uncle, brother of Oedipus, issues a decree that the body of Polynices should be left unburied because he's been a traitor to the city. Uh, Creon's niece, Antigone, the daughter of Oedipus and sister of Eteocles and Polynices, decides to bury her brother anyway, defying Creon. And most people think of the play The Antigone as being about Antigone. They think about it as uh, this effort to adhere to the law of the gods, which require burial, and uh, to uh, in over to prioritize that law over the law of the city, Creon's edict that Polynices should not be buried. But in fact, I would argue that the play is really about Creon. Uh, he is the figure who undergoes a fundamental transformation over the course of the play. Antigone is unrelenting in her angry nature and character and doesn't change up until the point of her death. But the turning point in the play is the moment when Creon has gone to release Antigone. And let me tell you a little bit about what has happened just before he did that. He has been, people have been consistently arguing with him to say that he should change course, he's not doing the right thing. And he doesn't listen, as you can see here. You know, the, he says to the guard, do you not know even now how much your voice sickens me? And the guard says, is the pain in your ears or in your soul? And in an exchange between Antigone and Creon too, Antigone tries to convince him again, how could I have won a nobler glory than by giving burial to my own brother? Everybody here, which is to say the chorus of elders, would admit that they approve if fear did not grip their tongues. But to tyranny, blessed with so much else, has the power to do and say whatever it pleases. You alone, says Creon, out of all these Thebans see it that way, and Antigone, they do too, but for you they hold their tongues. So a distorted public sphere, right? A public sphere where speech is not functioning, the tyrant is not hearing. People keep making this argument to Creon. Finally, the prophet Tiresias does manage to convince him. Tiresias says, go release Antigone and bury Polynices. So Creon finally dashes off, but unfortunately hasn't quite listened. He goes first to bury Polynices, and only then afterwards to release Antigone. And as a consequence, he arrives too late, just after she's hung herself, and just after Hymon has found her and has killed himself. So his not listening, even at that final moment, brings about the death of his son. And as he's approaching the cave, he hears Hymon's voice, and he says in the play, is that the voice of my son Hymon I that I hear? And the word for hear there, Sunyemi, is also the word for understand. It's the moment of recognition, the first time that Creon has recognized what he should have been hearing all along. And at that point, his son is dead, his wife is soon dead, he suffers through his downfall. So if one thinks of the play as being about Creon that way, then one also has to think about the play as being about speech and silence in a way that gives us a different picture of the public sphere. Um, so let me say a little bit more about uh, speech and silence and how we get a different picture of the public sphere from this. So Hymon, Creon's son, had said to him, dread of your glance forbids the ordinary citizen to speak such words as would offend your ear. But I can hear these murmurs in the dark, how the city moans for this girl, saying, no woman ever merited death less, none ever died so shamefully for deeds so glorious as hers. Such is the word, fatis, 
shrouded in darkness that silently spreads. So, you know, focus on that Greek word phatis for a moment. Uh, it means generally common talk or rumor. It can also mean a word from heaven or an oracular word. And it's like or linked to another word feme in the Greek, which becomes fama in the Latin, which means rumor, but can also mean an utterance prompted by the gods. And we get the word fame, of course, uh, from fama. And just to underscore the point that these words are associated with divinity, this is obviously not an ancient, but uh, you know, sort of a German uh, uh, image uh, sculpture of the goddess Fama. Um, so some of you probably recognize it. Um, at any rate, uh, but the concepts are associated with divinity on the negative side as well as on the positive side. So uh, the opposite of feme is blasphemy, from which we get the word blasphemy. It means both to speak profanely and to slander. And there it's worth then remembering that the word diabolos, uh, which means slanderer, also means devil, and it is the word from which we get devil. So a devil is ultimately a slanderer, uh, somebody who uh, passes along lies, often anonymous lies, and so forth. Um, so the point there is that we have a discursive field around this silent speech, uh, to come back to Creon's phrase, um, words shrouded in darkness that silently spread. And the discursive context is both positive and negative. So anonymous words can be the words of the gods. And in Greek tragedy generally, the laws of the gods are often described as being authorless. Right? They endure without a sense of their origin in terms of time or in terms of author. Um, but similarly, such talk without an author um, can be the talk of the devil, of a slanderer instead. So that brings us then to a way of schematizing this additional kind of talk which um, helps structure the public sphere. It can be divine or diabolic. Um, as divine or diabolic, I think the discursive field is indicating that this kind of speech has a special power. So there are some things about this type of speech which are familiar from other kinds of speech. The one has special access to truth and eternal verity. It's impartial. The diabolic speech is false and it's interested. It seeks advantage. Um, but both somehow have a special kind of power which derives from their anonymity. So we're trying to figure out exactly what that power is. And again, the Antigone is going to help us. Um, so, it's not that Creon hasn't heard any of the other, of this kind of silent speech um, in the city, the sort of the speech that has its face shrouded, this dark speech, the sort of speech that goes without revealing its, its name, its face. Um, so he said, no, from the very first, certain men of the city were chafing at my edict and muttering against me, tossing their heads in secret, and they did not keep their necks duly under the yoke in submission to me. So he'd heard the muttering, but he'd misinterpreted it. And this is a good little piece of evidence that one of the things that goes on with anonymous speech is that it shifts cost from the speaker to the listener. The listener has to figure out who's speaking, what their motives are, uh, what the reason is for their anonymity. And in doing so, in making all those interpretations, a listener can go badly wrong, as Creon goes here. Okay? But, so the power of anonymous speech is in putting extra burdens on the listener. That's one source of its power. The other source of its power, I think, comes from its close connection to the world of intimacy. So uh, read through the example in a second, but it's worth noting that anonymity and gossip are closely related to each other, of course, a social phenomenon. And gossip is in representations, literary and artistic, associated with women as opposed to men. And so this is a good indicator, too, of the way in which anonymous speech can have a role in politics that has not been historically at the center of the frame in terms of our analysis of the public sphere. So insofar as women were not part of the public sphere until the 20th century, by and large, um, you know, obviously major exceptions in the form of monarchs in different countries, but at any rate, insofar as women were by and large not part of the public sphere, the kind of speech associated with women, gossip, is also a kind of speech that moves around the margins of the public sphere. It moves in the private world mostly, but now and then can work its way into public life. And that's what we see happening in the Antigone. In fact, it's a play that begins and ends with the gossip of women at the edges of the city. So again, helps us to rethink what the figure of the public sphere is doing. 
You remember, of course, that Antigone, the play, begins when Antigone, our character, drags her sister, Ismene, outside of the city gates and says, now what is this new edict that they say the general has just decreed to all the city? Do you know anything? Have you heard? Or does it escape you that evils from our enemies are on the march against our friends? Ismene answers that she hasn't heard anything, and so Antigone says, I knew it well, so I was trying to bring you outside the courtyard gates to this end, that you alone might hear. So there's a special link of intimacy established through this conversation in the private space, which is the space of gossip, essentially. And similarly, at the end of the play, Eurydice gets her news about Hymon's death in the, in the same sort of way. People of Thebes, I heard your words as I was on my way to the gates to address Divine Palace with my prayers. At one and at the same time, I was loosening the bolts of the gate to open it, and the sound of a blow to our house struck my ears. In terror, I sank back into the arms of my handmaids, and my senses fled. But repeat what your news was, for I shall hear it with ears that are no strangers to sorrow. So the second source of anonymity's power, I would argue, is that it blurs this line between the formal but artificial line between private and public and uses intimacy to establish trust that can have political consequences. I could say more about that, but I'll just leave it there. So now then, I'd like to suggest that as we are dissecting anonymous speech, we can add a specific account of its power to our list of what the divine version is and what the diabolic version is. Okay. So where does that get us? Um, so then the divine versions of the speech, of such speech, so the speech of a whistleblower, for example, or the speech of a chorus, which is trying to tell Creon a truth that he will not hear, is it's the use of this special power of anonymity to rectify power imbalances, problematic power imbalances. Whereas in contrast, the diabolic version of such, such speech, the speech of a slanderer, is also using the power of anonymity, but for purposes of advantage or domination. So in that regard, anonymous speech presents the same old problems of power that every other form of political activity presents. It can be used for good or ill, uh, for power aimed at achieving just balances of power or power aimed at domination. So um, I'm going to... Then we have to ask a question about how to think about the role of power in the public sphere. I'm not going to take us through Arendt again, um, but just ask that question. And this is a question which I think political theorists often formulate as a choice between whether to follow Plato and his story about the Ring of Gyges or James Madison and his view about the role of government in human life. So what's the ring of Gyges? In the Republic, this is a ring that makes its holder invisible. And the idea is, once a person's invisible, they can do anything they want. They can rape and pillage and acquire power and you know, steal everybody's gold and so forth, acquire everything they want in the way of material goods and satisfaction without ever being held accountable, without anybody knowing that they're doing it. And so then Socrates asks the question, well, what would stop somebody from doing this if they could do it, if they could misuse power in this way? And the answer that Socrates gives and that Plato seems to endorse is that people's internal character needs to be cultivated in such a way that is toward virtue so that even if given this sort of freedom and temptation, they would not use it for the sake of domination, but would instead use it for the sake of good action in the world. Um, James Madison argued, on the other hand, that it wasn't possible to cultivate virtue in this way throughout a citizenry, so that one needed government instead. Right? The full phrase is that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. So his argument was that one had to think about power and managing power by focusing on the construction of institutions in order to make sure that nobody could actually, nobody had the freedom to take advantage of each other in the sorts of ways that um, I gestured at with the phrase about diabolical uses of power. So there's been a very long argument in the history of political philosophy about which approach to take. My own argument in terms of thinking about anonymous speech uh, is one for a merger of the two, both an argument that there are certain kinds of institutional forms that can help us deal with anonymity, but that we also need to think about cultivating various practices or habits of citizenship to support the just use of discourse in the public sphere. 
I'm not going to go through all of that now because that's not our purpose. Our purpose, as I said to start, is to think about the relevance of the classics to thinking about contemporary political problems. And so I want to conclude just by drawing your attention to the different ways in which I've used antiquity in trying to think through this problem for myself um, and try to then, once I've pointed out these ways, um, make a case that there is something um, necessary about the Greek and Roman case. It's not just the accident of tradition uh, that makes it useful to me. So what are the ways I've used antiquity? Um, I began, you'll recall, with definitions of the public sphere from Hannah Arendt and Jürgen Habermas. They both understood those definitions to come from the Greek. The point here is that the vocabulary we have for talking about politics has been built out of Greek and Roman vocabulary. So there is a way in which we can't talk about politics without using terms and definitions already given to us from this, built out of this tradition. So to that regard, one could say, well, yes, one's using Greek and Roman things as a matter of tradition, but one's doing that because the tradition is, at this point, so long, so thick, so durable that there's no point trying to start over to reinvent the, you know, all the different wheels that it's generated. Okay, so I, I am using the ancient tradition in this way. It's given us our vocabulary of politics. I'll continue to use it. There's a second approach, um, that of the philosopher Heidegger, um, who, which makes the argument that ancient languages generally, and the Greek with being a special case of it, are revelatory of the phenomen phenomenological situation of human beings in the world. That is, that as words came into existence, the speakers of those first words caught something about the relationships between human beings and their environment, time and space at its most fundamental uh, nature, but at any rate, their environment generally, so that one can look back into those early words in order to understand something fundamental about human existence. Um, and so to the degree that I was picking up that discursive frame that juxtaposed the words um, fatis and feme and blasphemy and diabolos, uh, I was following a kind of Heideggerian approach to reading an ancient language for its intuitions about the structure of the world and human experience. Um, the third uh, way in which I've been using ancient materials, and in some sense, so this is my turn back to Antigone, um, it rests on the notion that there is a special status of politics in Greece and Rome. And what I mean by this is that not that politics hasn't existed the world over and in all kinds of different social forms, but that the Greeks and then the Romans made explicit to themselves that there was a domain of human activity called politics. And then in making that explicit to themselves, invested more time and energy in trying to understand its basic structure and operations. And because of politics having acquired this special status for the ancient Greeks and Romans, one could argue that they got farther, faster in terms of thinking about this than other cultures and therefore um, give us um, an example of how to um, anatomize the political landscape. Um, so this I'm taking from Benjamin Constant's argument about the liberty of the ancients and the moderns, where uh, his argument was that the, for the ancients, politics was everything. Their lives depended on, their sense of self, the, their meaning of their lives to themselves depended on their participation in politics and their ability to make politics meaningful to themselves. He contrasted the ancients to, to us, uh, to the moderns, as the, where our orientation was towards commercial experience. Um, trading, consumption, wealth gathering, and so forth, but we didn't make our meaning for ourselves or think that our personal uh, worth depended on politics. So that's the contrast he's drawing. And then the final um, approach is one, I mean, you could put other names here too, but just one example would be Sigmund Freud, um, who obviously you know, relied on things like the images of Oedipus and so forth to talk about our, our psychological makeup in the present. Um, one can make the argument there are simply e eternal basic human problems, um, and so one can look to other answers from uh, antiquity to how to think about those problems as resources. And I, in, so, as I said, I've used all four of these approaches in terms of um, drawing on the ancient world. Um, I am, in my analysis of speech here, uh, implicitly making an argument that the problems of 
truth and falsehood, sincerity and insincerity, the desire to, uh, to share in an equitable way or the, the desire to dominate affect the value of speech and communication for the construction of common lives um, in ways that are continuous from antiquity to the present. So I am relying on the fourth as well as on the other three. Um, have I said anything here then that makes the ancient Greek and Roman case necessary? It's really only the third point I think that makes the ancient Greek and Roman case necessary. The idea that they prioritize politics to themselves in their own explanation of what they were doing um, and in so doing um, are teachers for the world in how to think about politics. That would be uh, the proposal I would put to you this afternoon, and I imagine that you'll have uh, lots of uh, ways to take issue with it, and so I look forward to the conversation. So, Angelos, you'll join me. Right. And can we have the lights up? Is that okay for the conversation? That's great, thank you. And you don't have a mic, do you? Can we use yours? Great. Okay. I'll just I'll put this on the table. Maybe we can pass it back and forth. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Sorry for. So we'd love to have your questions, um, either about the specifics of this or the first stage of conversation about the role of uh, relevance of antiquity to thinking about present political problems. Using the silence, which was the subject with which you began your talk, perhaps I could make um, a short uh, remark. Uh, I was fascinated by your reading of Antigone and the importance of anonymity in relations of power. And I have an additional case which shows the contrast between naming and remaining anonymous in uh, power. And this is the example that the case of magic. In magic, in cursing, not in prayer for justice, or not in prayer in general, the defigants, the person who curses, is anonymous, whereas the person who is being cursed has a name. Sometimes this goes as far as the only thing that you need to do when you curse someone is just to give his name and nothing else, whereas you remain in the safety of anonymity. And this also applies to ostracism, where you have thousands of angry men coming together with one single purpose, which is to harm someone, to impose, inflict pain on someone else by writing his name, remaining themselves anonymous. And one can find perhaps an analogy in another subject that you uh, are interested in, that is the use of the internet. Again, the importance of anonymity, for instance, in having uh, usernames or uh, not giving your name in your email account, having um, either aliases or numbers and so on, in order not to be subject to the control, which is always implied by being uh, named by being named individually and being identified. Yeah, no, those are very helpful points. Thank you. Yes, let's see. A few rows back. Yeah. If, if, if you were to pursue the argument, you could say that anonymous voting is also a diabolical device. I mean, ostracism wasn't meant to harm anyone. It was to keep people away from the city when they were becoming a danger to the city. At least that's the way it was perceived at the time. Uh, people who were, uh, who were ostracized didn't lose anything. They, they didn't lose, uh, they, they were not uh, deprived of any, any honor. They were simply kept away for a certain number of years. 
May I respond to this? this you already answered uh, your question. This is how it was perceived, but this doesn't mean that it is the way, the way it was practiced. And we know that it wasn't practiced this way through the graffiti that we sometimes find on Ostraka. Do not only name an individual who is supposed to be exiled for 10 years, but make from obscene to whatever remarks against this individual, showing it is not just the idea of keeping someone away, as is the theory of ostracism, but trying really to uh, dishonor him. And this is what we can learn from the insults that are written on the Ostraka, in addition to the name. The same with the book. Yeah. So just to um, yeah, sort of footnote on that, I mean, I, I hope that um, it came across that I, and the important point about anonymity is that it's not in itself diabolical, right? That it can be either divine or diabolical. So one can raise the example of anonymous voting, and one still has another question to ask about whether or not it's productive or counterproductive for political life. Um, that said, generally on the subject of ostracism, I mean, I think uh, I, I would agree with Angelos that the perception is that it's not uh, meant to be harmful, but I mean, if you look at its history, including the, uh, its end, at the end of the fifth century, um, it's the last people who were ostracized, I mean, for, that, the, for them, those ostracisms were incredible political defeats. So insofar as political victory is beneficial in a variety of ways, I think one has to assume that political defeat is harmful, too, and that you know, those who are defeating them are you know, defeating them, <laughs> not neutrally. Um, so next, yeah, to you. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, There's supposed to be questions. I'm sorry. Maybe to to follow up on this uh, on this discussion. Um, in your presentation, as a central point, you uh, you, you said that uh, anonymous speech, uh, either uh, divine or diabolical, had power. Uh, and you related it, if I understood well, uh, to anonymity. Um, uh, I, drawing on ethnographic examples, which are not very different from what Angelos just mentioned, but also from uh, the uh, interpretation of truth-telling paresia uh, by Michel Foucault, uh, couldn't we suggest um, to reverse the relation of causality, saying that words in the political or public sphere uh, have uh, power, they are dangerous, that, for example, naming somebody as a witch or a sorcerer or naming somebody as a uh, tyrant uh, is something that is performative and therefore dangerous. So um, it, uh, it would be, uh, in that case, because words have power that they have to be uh, pronounced anonymously and not uh, uh, because they are anonymous that they have power. So that's just a, a question or a suggestion. Um, thank you. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I agree with you, but with the qualification. Um, I mean, yes, words certainly have power. So I should have been more precise uh, in making the case that um, anonymity seems to be credited with a special power, right? So in other words, that it's anonymous speech that gets called divine or diabolic because there's some extra charge. So then the question is, what's the extra charge? And I think, so what I was trying to suggest there is that um, it's, it's, the abil it's capacity to shift sort of an equilibrium perception about how power is distributed through speech, right? So in other words, if there were nothing but anonymous speech, our communicative world would break down. So the norm, the equilibrium point, is the use of names. And it's been against that, the backdrop of that equilibrium that anonymous speech does something special. It's got a power to shift that equilibrium. Um, so I think one has to understand it in relationship to the kinds of power that come through ordinary um, discourse. But. Yes, sorry, Derek. I have a question. Oh, Regarding the special status of politics in Greece and Rome, how important do you think that was in projecting their political power and the military power throughout the ancient world? 
Um, that's a really good question. Um, so, and maybe just to pull in Didier's comment too, I mean, um, so Didier began by saying, I've got ethnographic examples from a variety of other cases, right? And that, this is always the issue that I struggle with, is how much is Greece and Rome just another ethnographic example, and how much is it um, a special case? And so your suggestion is that as a special case, it's a special case because it, it made itself that as an act of power in itself, and so in, the, in that regard, potentially continues to dominate by my view, you know, by my subscribing to the view that it uh, has a special power. In my brief comment would be that perhaps the involvement of the citizenry in politics in Greece and Rome would create a stronger citizen and a greater ability to project power because of the involvement uh, of their citizens in the political process, an example being the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. I could say more, but Angelus, would you No, no, I uh, agree. And I think that uh, in the case of Greece and Rome, uh, the, there has been, and this is something that I'm going to address briefly in my own uh, presentation, uh, there was um, a tendency uh, until recent times to give it a higher priority as if uh, Greece and Rome have a superior position to other cultures and so on. I think that uh, the reason that such phenomena can be fruitfully studied by taking into consideration Greece and Rome uh, has to do with certain similarities with phenomena in our Western civilization, such as, for instance, experiments with the uh, rule of the people or democracy, living in urban centers, um, uh, globalization processes, creation of networks, and so on. So it is not, but on the other hand, of course, Greece and Rome have their own particularities, and it is the task of a historian always to remind that Greece and Rome is not the same as the contemporary uh, world, despite the similarities and the analogies that we may use. Thank you. Uh, is that, I can't see it quite back. Is that Rohini in the very back? Yeah. And there's also Dirk. Um, okay. On that side, yeah. So, Daniel, I'm going to ask you to reflect on an economist's uh, version of, of what anonymous speech does. And so, on the one hand, what speech does is to try and make decision makers closer, take decisions that are closer to the objectives of the speaker. So they try to move decision makers towards themselves. And the second role of speech is to provide information. So economists have argued that anonymous speech loses its power because people don't know where you're coming from. You don't know which of these two things is happening. You don't know whether someone just wants you to do things that they like or whether they're really telling you something informative. And in a sense, if you take that further, you can say that anonymous speech is most powerful when there isn't a conflict of interest when everyone is really the same, because then the informative role of anonymous speech is large relative to the preference role. Uh, so do you find that historically, anonymous speech has been more powerful when polities have been less conflictual? Um, that's an interesting question. I um, just want to real fast um, show you. Um, this uh, effort, I don't know if you can read it. Can you still see it despite the lights being up? Okay. Uh, the New York Times in 2005 started trying to think about how to deal with the proliferation of anonymity in the, on its own pages. That is to say, more of their reporters were referring to anonymous sources. And this was exactly for their readers discrediting the paper because readers didn't know how to take what they were getting. Um, and so they came up with this recommendation. Um, that when anonymity is unavoidable, reporters and editors must be more diligent in describing sources more fully. The basics include how the anonymous sources know what they know, quality of the information, right? So that's truth or false. Why they are willing to provide the information. So what's their motivation? Are they sincere or insincere? And why are they entitled to anonymity? In other words, what's the power story that justifies anonymity in this case? So it's exactly the three points that I was pulling out about anonymous speech, which actually, as it happens, are the three, t three features of speech that Habermas also pulls out when he wants to talk about how you judge uh, whether speech is being used to build to a successful deliberative outcome. But so in brief, so then the question is, 
um, your question about the relative power or lack thereof of anonymous speech. Um, what I was trying to suggest was, uh, while I think anonymous speech fails to function you know, f effectively for informational purposes, um, and, and to some degree less effectively in terms of driving decision makers, um, there are other things that are being done through communication that can be effective even in cases of conflict. And so this relates to the sources of power I was identifying, so it's shifting costs to the listener. So the listener may then make worse decisions, right? Um, that can be beneficial to the speaker. So one has to remember that sometimes you want to trick people into making a bad decision and that anonymity can help that actually. Um, and then, the, so in, in Creon's case, he, he does not have an adequate understanding of his circumstances precisely because it's become too difficult to interpret what he's hearing. And because he has a bad understanding, he makes bad decisions and then, you know, it leads to his downfall. Um, and then the second thing is the shifting, blurring the private public line and drawing on intimacy. That is useful for developing solidarity, regardless of the caliber of the information being passed. And as solidarity is developed, you can shift alliances and so forth, which themselves then can shift political outcomes. So it has different kinds of power, and I think that's exactly the point. And I don't think the issue of conflictual contexts versus consensus contexts um, should matter, actually, for identifying where and when anonymity has had power. Um, so I've got, uh, I've got Dirk and Daryl and Cecile and then the gentleman up, uh, on my left here. So if we could go in, in that order, if that's okay. Um, just to take another uh, ancient Greek category that I think is linked with anonymity, parousia, uh, frankness of speech. Um, Peter Brown makes the argument that you see philosophers being used more in embassies and so on and so forth, because they're thought to have uh, frankness of speech. And that capacity for frankness of speech is linked to their peculiar sort of power, which is having fewer interests than other people. Right? I will tell you how it is just like it is, and you can exile me for it. Uh, that doesn't really damage my interests because I don't care. Right? I'm a citizen of the world. And so there's a certain sort of power, I take it, in that kind of speech. The freedom to say exactly what you think, which on the one hand comes from something like intimacy. I'm telling you this because this is what I think you need to know, though I think it's going to upset you. But on the other hand has something of that power of anonymity in the sense that uh, in a peculiar way, the person delivering the unwelcome news is, as we're sort of immune to blowback for it, in much the same way that you're immune to blowback when your name isn't signed to it. And so I think Parisia is sort of in an interesting position there between power and intimacy and anonymity. Thank you. I think maybe we should uh, hear from a group of people and then we can, yeah. Make the transition. So Daryl was next. I can. Others. So Danielle, I was, I was wondering if you maybe could clarify for me a, a little bit more this distinction between the contingent and the necessary relevance of ancient politics for or ancient sort of political categories for contemporary politics because. When you introduced it, I thought that the distinction was something like this, that the, that the, the contingent, the, the view that, they were, that the relevance was contingent was something like, well, we just happen to find ourselves in a tradition in which these are the sort of the forebearers of the tradition. And, and because of that, we refer back to, uh, to our ancestors uh, in, in, in the tradition. And the, and, the, and the necessary was something like, well, there's some special insight that they have that is sort of unavoidable and it's of the nature of politics and we keep going back to it because it's not just because we stand in the tradition but because there's special insight that, that's there that's it's about the political realm itself. And that maybe that's the incorrect understanding that, that I have and, and, and I'm, I'm suspicious that it is incorrect because then when you listed the four um, things at the end there, the, the one that you said that you thought was the, um, the necessary was the third. And, 
I guess I would have thought, given my understanding, that you would have said it was the second and the fourth, that it's the Heideggerian or the, or the Freudian, that, we, that the relevance of politics um, would be, uh, or ancient politics would be thought of as, as necessary if we thought that there was something about the speech that peculiarly illuminated the human condition, or if there was something about, um, about human nature that was peculiarly captured by the ancient tradition, either the second or the fourth, and, and not the third. So I, I don't know if I'm not understanding the distinction or the application of the distinction or, 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 or where my confusion lies. Great, thank you. Uh, Cecile? And, and the way in which democracy has been uh, justified from from the Greek authors onwards. So, if you if you think of Condorcet through to Rousseau through to Habermas, there is the view that the the intrinsic quality of decision making is enhanced by the fact that it's anonymous. Right? You find that in classical social choice uh, theories of politics as well. It's precisely because we are less suspicious of a power that comes from aggregation of a plurality of voices, uh, there is the sense that the transparency and the democratic nature of decision making is gonna be enhanced precisely if uh, power is anonymous. It is less suspicious if it's seen to come from an aggregation of multiple, uh, multiple Voices, right? and this is Condorcet's defense of of public democracy. I just wonder if you could say a bit more about this. Great, thank you. And the gentleman up to the back. Okay. I too would like to talk about num uh, C, the special status of politics in Greece and Rome. The assumption throughout has been that that is somehow normative, and when one cites constant as the inadequacy of modern culture because it depends upon commerce rather than giving a positive special status to politics. Uh, that I think, uh, if I may put an 18th century British perspective upon that, and that is the demonstrable association of liberty and property and freedom. And whether we're looking at Joseph Addison and Whig politics, whether we're looking at uh, somebody like uh, Adam Smith or more recently Milton uh, Friedman, we have a very similar assumption that essentially ancient Rome, especially from imperial Augustus forward, is irrelevant and destructive to the liberty it claims to have. It controls art, it destroys the Senate, it ultimately leads to the collapse of Rome. When Alexander Pope writes his own epitaph, it is, heroes and kings your distance keep. In peace, let one poor poet sleep, who never flattered folks like you, let Horace blush and Virgil too. And he says that the Aeneid does not have a single honest line in it. It is a party piece for the Augustan Principate. And part of what 18th century British political and economic thinkers do is then say, what is the alternative to the demonstrably corrupt Roman model that some people thought we inherited? And that becomes the model of commerce that brings a polite and commercial people that ensures in British political and economic thought uh, some form of liberty uh, that the Romans could not possibly have thought of because obviously based upon uh, a slave culture, which was odious to all human beings. And so when we think about the special status of politics in Greece and Rome as a normative thing, I think we also need to think about its demonstrable inadequacies and the way in which it becomes quite deservedly rejected in more civilized cultures. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just take a minute to try to respond to all four comments, if you don't mind me doing that. To say, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you will have very much to say very soon. So. <laughs> okay. um, so I wanted to take the last comment and uh, Daryl's together, and then I'll come back to the points about Parasia and Condorcet, um, if that's okay. Um, so it is maybe worth uh, saying here that there is actually a way in which, um, in terms of the history of uses of antiquity for thinking about politics, we are in um, a, a different moment than 100 years ago, 200 years ago, uh, and so forth, uh, which these comments uh, call out. So first, um, on contingency versus necessity, um, there were two types of contingency I was referring to. One, the idea that we're just part of a tradition. The other, that 
Um, it, and thinking about ancient Greece and Rome can be useful because of the difference of the case from our own experience and because of the contained nature of the case. The archive is complete and so forth. So there's a way in which it becomes contingently another valuable ethnographic case um, to set against our own. Um, so it was uh, against uh, really that sort of second type of contingent. So I, I, the, the Heideggerian um, answer, for example, applies to a variety of ancient languages, not just the Greek one, right? Uh, so that's the sense in which, at the end of the day, I was coming down on uh, C, um, the idea that um, the ancients did something right with politics, which is still useful and something we should think about. So yes, then the criticism of that um, from Constant and others who wanted to reject the ancient case is important, although that, the 18th century story is more complicated, of course, right, because at least the American founders wanted to take the Roman model and did sort of throughout the Federalist Papers and in various other ways draw on it in terms of figuring what the new republic should be. So there was a, a divided discourse um, even at the moment. But so then this is where I think um, the difference now in the late 20th, early 21st century is interesting, um, that the Roman case has really fallen away as an example, actually. I mean, you will speak to that a bit differently, I think, but within the world of political theory and philosophy, um, with the exception of some people who, are, who advocate for an idea of republicanism based on a Roman model, I think the Greek model is more dominant. Um, and I think that actually has a lot to do, in fact, with uh, the discovery at the end of the 19th century of the Constitution of Athens and a whole lot of other discoveries of texts and material throughout the course of the 20th century so that you have people like Josh Ober who are able to present a very different picture um, of what happened in Athenian democracy than previously. And I think the argument made on the basis of the historical work um, reinvigorates the notion that um, the, the case of democracy in Athens um, is a special case um, which sets it apart generally from the sort of range of ethnographic cases one might draw on in trying to think about politics. So, so f in terms of my own work, I actually don't generally draw on the Roman case. So in that regard, I agree with your critics, uh, 18th century critics of the Roman case. Um, so on the last more, points pertinent to my immediate argument about anonymity, uh, you're right, I need to think about Condorcet and take that on board and take on board generally the role of anonymity um, in, uh, through aggregation in institutional forms. So although I am trying to make the case that it really is good and bad, um, and so one needs to understand which ways it is each thing, um, and again, I'm trying to understand its special power, so I, that helps there. And the example of Paresia is a very good one, I think, because uh, Didier mentioned Foucault's use of the term, too. I mean, there's an example of a piece of vocabulary that developed out of the Athenians' very self-conscious efforts to think about politics, right? It has an etymology which is very revealing, saying everything. Um, and it opens up a world for thinking about politics which is not immediately accessible to us otherwise. So um, it is a really good example to bring up and I think um, sort of makes both the Heideggerian point um, and also um, point C about special status um, of politics in Athens. I haven't addressed the issue of frankness, uh, which is important, but we're out of time, really. So. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for this conversation, and I'm going to hand things over to my colleague. So, uh, we should start now with the second part of today's seminar. This very much looked like the stage of an ancient theater, and this looks like the auditorium of an ancient theater. And in ancient theater, the tragedy was followed by the satyr play. So, after Antigone, we move to the Monty Python and the life of Brian. What have the Romans ever done for us is the question asked by a member of the People's Front of Judea in the best movie with a historical subject ever made. If we add the Greeks as well, then we have a question which classicists and ancient historians are asked to answer, sometimes in order just to justify their existence, in other times in order to get funding, but sometimes also in order to reflect on the relevance of what they are doing 
and also in order to reflect on the possibilities for a dialogue between their discipline and other disciplines, or their discipline and society at large. The answers to this question may be very diverse. For instance, the study of the Roman Empire has been one of the fundaments for the study of imperialism in the 19th and early 20th century in connection with the British Empire, nowadays in connection with the hegemony of the United States, which is often labeled as Pax Americana uh, on the model of Pax Romana. The Roman Empire has also been exploited in order to critically review the process of European unification. And, of course, the Athenian democracy has always been incorporated into modern discussions about democracy uh, in political and social sciences. Ancient history, in general, has often been the object of ideological exploitation, sometimes uh, or whether be by the Nazis or the agent, agents of British colonial rule, but nowadays also by the feminist movement uh, or other global movements. Spartacus, for instance, was not only a symbol for the Spartacists in uh, Germany between 1916 and 1919, but also of the new Spartacists in the uh, global movement. In the dialogue between the classics, the dialogue between classics and the contemporary world is alive and kicking. For instance, Nancy Sherman argues in her book Stoic Warriors that Stoic philosophy, including principles of self-discipline, self-sacrifice, and serving a cause larger than oneself, may contribute to an understanding of modern American military. In a recent book, provocatively entitled How the Ancient Greeks and Romans Solved the Problems of Today, Peter Jones has discussed how the study of the past may contribute to the solution of modern problems, among others, life in mega cities, taxation, justice, crime and punishment, education, war and religious intolerance. But the views concerning the instructive value of the Greek and Roman past are not, or such views, are not shared by everyone. In fact, in secondary education, ancient Greece and Rome are either absent or little attention is paid to them, or in general, to classical antiquity. And this decline of ancient paradigms in secondary education is in part the result of a reaction to the dominant use of the Greek and Roman past until uh, very recently. It was a reaction in part justified to too much emphasis placed on the Greek and Roman worlds neglecting other cultures. I would like to call this phenomenon the Gus Portokalos syndrome. In the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, Gus Portokalos claims that every word derives from Greek. Similarly, for a long time in Western education, in particular in Europe, the study of ancient Greece and Rome was given a privileged position, the normative position that was referred to in the discussion previously. It was indeed sometimes mystified. The Edinburgh Academy, for instance, an independent institution, advertised the teaching of Greek and Latin in 2009, claiming that this is a superior mental training. I don't think that I'm harming classics if I do not believe that people who learn Greek and Latin become smarter. There are very good reasons to study Greek and Latin, but not necessarily in order to increase your IQ. If the classical world is relevant to our understanding of current political phenomena, this is not connected in any way with any particular superiority of the Greeks or the Romans, but it is connected, as I mentioned before in the discussion, with some similarities and analogies between ancient Greece and our world. For instance, life in urban centers, economic and cultural networks, early forms of globalization that one can observe both in the Hellenistic world and in the Roman Empire, uh, life in multicultural environments, for instance in Ptolemaic Egypt, mobility, technological advancement, and experiments with the rule of the people with citizen participation in democracy. For my presentation, I have selected two phenomena, 
both of them from Greek antiquity, which may provide food for thought. Amnesty is the first, and theatrical behavior of statesmen is the second. The concept of amnesty is of great importance in the contemporary world. The word amnesty is part of the name of one of the strongest NGOs, Amnesty International, and grants of amnesty play and have played an important part in political discourse, especially in countries that were under the rule of authoritarian uh, regimes or have uh, emerged from civil wars. One of the best known cases is the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa recently. If I'm turning to the Greek paradigm, it is not because the word amnesty is Greek. Here you have the gas portokalos syndrome again. Uh, it is also not because the Greeks were the first who, as far as we can know, established the institution of amnesty, but it is because of the ways the Greeks responded to the fundamental dilemmas of amnesty, which are the choice which one has to take between the right of the dead, the right of revenge, and the advantage of the living, reconciliation and concord. It is the choice between, or the dilemma, uh, and the conflict between an emotion, which is anger, and reason, reconciliation, and going ahead with life in um, uh, a peaceful society. To ask a citizen to refrain from revenge and the prosecution of those who had committed injustice means to ask him not only to control affect, to control an emotion, but also to neglect two fundamental duties. The duty to respect justice and the duty to avenge the death of relatives. Amnesty required from citizens to give to the advantage of the living, concord and peace priority over the right of the dead. Amnesty agreements forbade the memory of bad things, this is what the Greeks designated with the word mnesikakein, and banned anger because of bad memories, mnesicholein. Thus, the Greeks intervened in interconnected emotional and cognitive processes, in memory and feeling. Amnesty means an intervention in remembering and feeling. Although Greek amnesty did not demand forgetting and forgiving, it still forbade punishment and reprisals that originated in anger in a sense, and in a sense of honor. This is why amnesty always failed. The best known case of a Greek amnesty was the reconciliation agreement in Athens in 2003 and 2002 that put an end to the rule of an oligarchic regime and allowed the Democrats to return to Athens. General immunity was granted with only a few exceptions, but a few years later we observed that a series of trials started in Athens against individuals who were actually a subject to amnesty, to immunity. The Athenian orator Lysias, whose brother was killed during the oligarchic regime, was one of the prosecutors. In his speeches against Eratosthenes and Agoratos, he describes in great detail his own sufferings and those of the Athenian people urging the jurors to remember and to be angry, that is to respond in exactly the opposite manner that the amnesty demands. He asked them to act in accordance with their anger, to, either, to show neither pity nor forgiveness and to condemn the defendants. I quote only a few passages from his speech against Eratosthenes. You now have reached the moment in which your thoughts must have no room for pardon or pity when you must punish Eratosthenes and his partners in power. If you condemn this man, you will declare your indignation at the things that have been done. And later on, you should feel the same anger as when you were exiles and remember the other injuries that you suffered from these men who with violent hands snatched some from the marketplace and some from the temples and put them to death. The two most important words in this piece is remember and be angry, remember and be angry, remember and be angry until the very end of the speech. This is why this speech was so effective. The Greeks were aware of the precarious state of amnesty agreements exactly because of this reason, and they responded with three measures. 
The first measure was to impose a new hierarchy of norms, concord, instead of revenge. This is um, something that we find in contemporary speeches. The second was to establish new rituals that would strengthen concord. If such rituals are, for instance, oath ceremonies, a very solemn occasion. An oath means not only taking an oath, but also cursing yourself in case you will not abide by the oath. I will give you one example of such an oath an inscription that was only discovered a few years ago from Dikaya in Macedonia. I will not hold bail against anyone, neither with words nor with deeds. I will not kill anyone as a result of the past conflicts or condemn him to exile or take his property. And if anyone holds bail, I will oppose to him. I will remo remove him from the altars, that is, I will not allow him to take sanctuary in a... In a, in a uh, in an altar, and I myself shall be removed from the altars. In addition to this, the Greeks introduced other rituals that would strengthen amnesty, the cult of homonoia, they personified the idea of concord, and they made concord into a goddess to whom sacrifices were offered and festivals were celebrated. They also introduced commemorative anniversaries that highlighted solidarity focusing on only some aspects of the past in a process of selective memory. But in one case, they also took very radical measures. They simply abolished existing family bonds. In the small city of Nacone in Sicily, a civil war had divided the community in the third century BC. Peace could be established, but general reconciliation was hard to achieve. Amnesty, in such a case, may forbid the prosecution of past acts of violence, but it cannot eliminate an emotion. It cannot eliminate the hatred. So the Naconians abolished the existing families and created entirely new families, making the former enemies two brothers. I quote a few lines from this very long and important inscription. The two factions shall present a list of 30 names of members of the other. Those who have previously been enemies shall write the names, each the names of their enemies. The magistrates shall transcribe the names of its faction separately on ballots, put them into vases, and choose by lot one member of its faction. They shall then choose by lot three men from the rest of the citizens, in addition to the former two, avoiding relationships as defined by law. Those united into the same group shall live as elective brothers with each other harmoniously in full justice and friendship. Just imagine that the Palestinians and Israelis are doing this and they become, so to say, elective brothers. In order to strengthen this, they also introduced a ritual that is a commemorative anniversary of this uh, agreement which took place every year. The question is, did it work? We don't know. This is the last inscription that we have from the city. <laughs> In Nakone, uh, this was uh, the effort. Now I have to move, because of reason time, to my second example, which is theatricality in public life. It is a common place that the invasion of the TV and other mass media in public life has had an enormous impact on public discourse and the behavior of statesmen. The TV set, and more recently the computer and the iPod screen, but also the internet, have become the most important lucky for the exchange of political arguments and the circulation of political ideas. Unavoidably, political behavior is modified in order to suit the conditions and the advantages of TV screens and cyberspace. And as the TV screen is associated with entertainment and spectacle, political behavior also adapts features of entertainment and spectacle. This phenomenon was already observed by Plutarch in the late first century AD in connection with popular assemblies that took place in theaters. He writes, when those who have come together gaze upon statues and paintings, on proscenia of theaters or extravagantly decorated roofs of council halls during the assembly, they become foolish, vain, and empty-headed. Theatrical behavior was a medium which was extensively applied, especially in the Hellenistic period, to support the rule of the elite on the one hand 
and hide discrepancy between the ideals and reality, the ideal of the rule of the people and the reality of the rule of hereditary elites on the one hand and uh, kings on the other. This is a very important cause of theatrical behavior. You have to conceal somehow the fact that reality does not exactly match the expectations. How do you do that? By wearing a mask and that pretending that something else is going on. I defined as theatricality the effort of individuals or groups to construct an image of themselves, which is at least in part deceiving because it is either in contrast to reality or because it exaggerates reality or it distorts reality. Through theatrical behavior, people try to gain control over the emotions and thoughts of their audiences. This is what I'm also doing uh, now by choosing the stage, uh, the attire that I have, the tone of speech, and so on. This is uh, an essential uh, feature in order to be able to control thoughts and emotions and uh, create an image that is somehow distinctive from reality. Theoretical behavior was employed both by kings and statesmen in the Hellenistic period in order to create the illusion that actually they are only like ordinary citizens. Of Agathocles in uh, Sicily, it is stated uh, that in his drinking parties he used to put off the pomp of kingship and show himself more humble than the ordinary citizens. I quote, being by nature also a buffoon and a mimic, not even in the meetings of the assembly did he abstain from jeering at those who were present and from portraying certain of them so that the common people would often break out in laughter. A very crucial issue, this is a very important element also in the behavior of statesmen, on the one hand to create the impression that they are different, that they are in control of things and they have the maturity and so on, but on the other hand to show that they are just one of us, they are part of the ordinary people. A very crucial issue in the public appearance and the public image also of kings was not to disturb the balance between, on the one hand, affability, being close to people, and on the other hand, remoteness, which is necessary for the respect of the leadership. And this is exactly the subject of a treatise on kingship by Diot uh, Diotogenes, who recommends to the monarch to set himself apart from human failings to be an imitator of the gods. In other words, to behave like an actor who behaves like the gods. I quote again a short passage. As regards public ad uh, addresses, the good king needs to take care of the suitable position and appearance. Forming a political and serious image of himself so that he appears to the multitude neither harsh the important word in all these passages is to appear neither harsh nor contemptible, but sweet and considerate. He shall achieve this if he is first majestic to watch and to listen to and seems worthy of his rule. Secondly, if he is kind in conversation and in appearance and in benefactions. Thirdly, if he is fearsome in his honesty and in punishing and in swiftness and generally in the experience and practice of kingship. Similarly, statesmen in Greek cities employed theatrical behavior in their communication with the mass of the citizens. And they did that also in the use of delivery in their orations. Delivery had always been very important in political oratory, and the relevant handbooks paid great attention to the control of the voice and the body language, recommending the use of postures and gestures appropriate for various occasions. Of course, we don't have the Greek treatises, but we have Latin Roman treatises like Rhetorica at Herennium or the works of Cicero and Quintilian, which are to a large extent based on Greek prototypes. Taking lessons from actors, Political orators should learn how to control their emotion, the emotions of the audiences with a proper use of body language. For instance, for the dignified conversational tone, the speaker must say in position when he speaks, lightly moving his right hand, his countenance expressing an emotion corresponding to the sentiments of the subject, gaiety or sadness or an emotion intermediate. 
For the explicative conversational tone, he shall incline the body forward in this, in this slide a little from the shoulders, since it is natural to bring the face as close as possible to our hearers when we wish to prove a point and arouse them vigorously. When the author of Rhetoric at Herenium observes that <laughs> good delivery ensures that what the orator is saying seems to come from his heart, the emphasis is on appearances, videatur, it seems, on the creation of an illusion. In Hellenistic times, political oratory had developed into a careful staged dramatic performance through which the statesman controlled the emotions of the assembly. The so-called Mantelstatuen, statues of citizens wrapped in a cloak, offer a characteristic example of how the members of the elite constructed their image. They represent the men who had been honored by the popular assembly. They show them in orderly, draped cloaks, avoiding luxury. Their body languages, the body language evokes self-control and reservation. Even when the arms are freed from the cloaks, drapery, and are projected forward to indicate energy and strain, they avoid the passionate gesticulation of the demagogues and underline self-control, a virtue of the educated man of the elite. Also contemporary portraits encapsulate in their facial expressions the vigor and the strenuousness with which these members of the elite carry out toilsome civic duties, not as an exercise of power, but actually as a service to the people. They represent the members of the elite with a mask of the virtue citizen in the proper dress and with facial expressions indicating exhaustion after the demanding efforts for public welfare. This brings to mind the advice given by Quintilian to orators. They should demonstrate their exhaustion by letting their dress fall in careless disorder and their toga slip loose by streaming with sweat and showing signs of fatigue, thus signaling that they had spared no strength for the interest of the clients. I cannot help but quote an account of George Bush Sr. congressional campaign in Houston in the 60s. I quote, over and over again, on every television screen in Houston, George Bush was seen with his coat slung over his shoulders, shoulders, his sleeves rolled up, walking the streets of his district, grinning, gripping, letting the voter know he cared. About what was never made clear. <laughs> Public life in the Hellenistic cities with their moderate democracies was dominated by protagonists, by kings, and by wealthy benefactors and other representatives of the urban elite. Given the assembly's established constitutional status in these cities, the Hellenistic statesmen had to rely on delicate skills of performance in order to manipulate the masses in the assembly and to preserve the fiction of the rule of the people. In contemporary politics, the statesman enters the house of every citizen but this seemingly direct communication between the politician and the citizen is only an illusion. This communication is one-sided, turning the citizens into passive audiences. Political debates in the parliament, speeches in electoral campaigns, and political interviews are staged in order to best exploit the possibilities offered by the media. The statesman knows that what he will reach the citizen will not be a complex and differentiated political argument, but a sound bite, a short phrase, an ironic comment, an impressive gesture, a facial expression, an image of only a few seconds, which can be isolated from its context, highlighted and repeated again and again. This photo was taken on the night of the Greek election of 2007 and is a characteristic example. It was selected from among thousands of photos made that night for the website of Nea Demokratia, the then winning party, because it presents the image of a successful statesman. A man who controls his emotions and allows only a moderate smile to express his joy at a narrow and unexpected victory. A man who inspires devotion, clearly expressed in the way his wife, standing on a lower level, looks upon him. A man who is more devoted to his invisible people, to whom his eyes are fixed, than to his private life and his wife. 
A man who knows how to get what he wants, we notice the possessive way in which he holds his wife. A virtual diagonal line divides the image into two halves, making our gaze move from the wife's eyes up to the prime minister's head and finally to the upper right corner and to the photo's ultimate message, the sign of victory, a success that results from moderation, harmony, and devotion. The image evokes peace and tranquility in direct contrast to the passionate and loud campaign period. This photo was not staged, but if Kostas Karamanlis or his PR managers were to stage a photo, this is most likely how it would look like. Harmony and devotion is the image promoted by the official website of the William J. Clinton Presidential Library and Museum. In this case, the image is certainly staged and theatrical. Two individuals, mature but still young, gaze devotedly into each other's eyes. If they can do this after all their prehistory, which is known to everyone, it is because they know how to set priorities, family values or their careers, because they know how to control their emotions, because they know how to manage a crisis and can show tolerance and indulgence. If they can solve their crisis, they can solve any crisis. In ancient drama, actors did not have faces. They wore masks, appropriate for a character or a role, the parasite, the courtesan, the stingy old man, and so on. In the modern dramas of public life, statesmen certainly have individual features and individual facial expressions, but as their public activities resemble the performance of a part in a stage play, the public images also resemble ancient theatrical masks, and one has the impression that the individuals become interchangeable. One such public mask, a theme with endless variations, is that of the statesman in the company of young people. Innocent infants, smart-looking children, young boys and girls full of hope, preferably multicultural. What we see is not Bill Clinton or Gordon Brown as individuals, but two actors playing the part of the statesman interested in education. You can have this image in variations, seated or standing with one child or with many. Do not ask the statesmen about details concerning education in their countries. Their audiences are willing to believe that they know the big picture and applaud them for playing this part successfully. In the Hellenistic period, elements of theatricality and illusion did not remain unnoticed, at least by the intellectuals, as we can judge from critical remarks in contemporary historians. In modern times, a poem of Cavafis's best captures this Hellenistic mood. It is his Alexandrian kings of 1912. I quote, the Alexandrians are gathered together to see Cleopatra's children, Caesarion and his brothers, Alexander and Ptolemy, whom they had led forth for the first time to the stadium, there to proclaim them kings, amid the brilliant procession of soldiers. The Alexandrians surely perceived that all these were theatrical words, but the day was warm and poetic, the sky a lucid azure blue, the Alexandria Stadium a triumphant achievement of art, the superb splendor of the country of the courtiers, Caesarion, all grace and beauty. And so the Alexandrians rushed to the ceremony and they grew enthusiastic and they cheered in Greek and in Egyptian and some in Hebrew, enchanted by the gorgeous spectacle, knowing full well the worth of these, what hollow words these kingships were. The Alexandrians knew full well. What about citizens in contemporary democracies? Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, according to the model of before, <laughs> we'll take questions, remarks, objections, please. There, 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 come. It's the next image. There you are. Whoops. Ah, yes, okay. So, questions? Uh, 
as in Gavafis' poem, the day is bright and uh, lucid and so on. I don't know if you want to rush outside, although we don't have a state uh, spectacle. I have, I have to jump, jump in and, um, so, um, may I ask a little bit, uh, ask you to say a bit more about the amnesty question and issue. Um, and the case that you were presenting, uh, the last one, was fascinating. Um, the notion of the mixing up of the factions and so forth with people who had not been involved in the first place. And um, this actually, I mean, this is a theme in lots of Josh Ober's work about the value of Athens is, is similar, namely that they had very different ways of thinking about um, mixing up populations through institutional forms in order to generate political possibilities that pre-existing commitments were blocking. So I guess I was wondering, um, as, as you think about the relevance of ancient to modern, how much is your focus on sort of the movement from culture to institution, and how much is it on culture? That is, is there something special about how the ancients linked culture and institution, or is the relevant comparison really just about cultural practices? This is a, obviously a very complex <laughs> question. I don't know how many hours I have at uh, the disposal <laughs> uh, to answer it. Um, I think that in, uh, as far as I can see in the examples that I have studied in my study focuses on the Hellenistic world, the emphasis is based on institution, right, not so much on culture. It is an institutional phenomenon. Of course, institutions do influence culture, but I think that the origin, in order to at least give a preliminary answer uh, to your question, is the legal, the normative, the institutional, and cultural changes is what results from that. Hmm. So that's, I mean, in some sense, that's what I'm asking is really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to my own um, argument or proposition that there is sort of a special case, um, the, the Greek and Roman <coughs> case present a spe special case, and I'm, I was wondering then through that, from that example, whether or not um, the, the way in which politics had a special status manifests itself sort of in some sense specifically in a kind of institutional inventiveness, which mm -hmm. is uh, rather unusual. So I, I was wondering whether you would agree with yeah. that view or? Uh, I would agree with um, one warning, and the warning is that in some cases we do not know who the agent of an institution is. For instance, in the case of Nakoni, uh, this may well not have been the initiative of the citizens themselves, but the initiative of an external arbitrator. And this would make a lot of um, a difference, of course, if this comes out of the initiative through political discourse in the assembly, asking uh, the question, how are we going to resolve this crisis? Or if this is imposed from outside through arbitrators who come from another city, and I think that there is enough evidence to imply that this is what was happening. This mm -hmm. also happened in the case of Athens, because again, the initiative for the reconciliation did not come from Athens, but came uh, from outside, and this is a pattern that uh, recurs uh, many times. Nevertheless, I would not exclude uh, the possibility in uh, several cases that this was the result of discussions uh, within uh, political groups, but not open discussions in the assembly, but mm -hmm. discussion in uh, more narrow bodies of mm -hmm. deliberation. Thanks. Yep, did okay. you? Yes, to feel the silence. Uh, go going back to this, um, the question of amnesty and the example you gave of the South African uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, I was wondering if there was not a competing uh, paradigm uh, that was not the Greek amnesty, but the Christian forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in especially, especially in that case, but I think maybe more generally in uh, other cases, maybe there's also a link between the Christian uh, forgiveness and the, um, and, and the Greek amnesty. But <clears throat> the fact that it was the Archbishop Desmond Tutu who was leading uh, the, what was seen as a confession 
before anything else. Uh, and the confession gave uh, the possibility of the amnesty. Uh, the fact that there was a prayer at the beginning of each hearing uh, make, makes me think that there might be a combination of the two. So, uh, and I'm, I'm really talking about competition, not about uh, mm -hmm. one model excluding the other. Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, in the original PowerPoint presentation that I had, I also had a small image of the book that Desmond Tutu wrote after that about forgiveness. And uh, this is um, something very particular in the case of the South African paradigm, which finds absolutely no uh, parallel in the Greek world where forgiveness is not an issue, at least in the cases uh, in which I have uh, studied. What is also interesting, and I had to omit uh, because of lack of time, is not only the case of amnesty, but the case in which amnesty was denied. And how important the concept of memory is in denying amnesty. In some cases, we have extremely detailed information about what happened exactly because this information was recorded in order to make clear people will not forget and people will remain affected by their emotion. Uh, this is the case, for instance, in the island of Lesbos, where some exiles uh, tried to uh, return. And in the discourses in the popular assembly, what happened is that those who opposed amnesty just narrated the story in great detail of how they had suffered during the tyranny in order to make sure that this doesn't happen. So again, this is connected with the idea of remembering, forgiving, uh, as opposed uh, to the uh, South African paradigm. Uh, interestingly, however, in South Africa, there were condemnations later on. For instance, the minister, uh, I think of interior or something like that, was condemned to 10 years jail, although he was never uh, imprisoned, despite the fact that the amnesty had already been uh, implemented. And we also have other cases in Latin American countries. Uh, Paul yeah. Yeah. You, you should Paul, go ahead. No? And then, yeah. yeah uh, 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 first Paul and then Menahem. Yeah, coming back to amnesty in South Africa, one might wonder whether uh, this parallel between two situations means that there is an actual link. And you might be interested to know that in South Africa, uh, Greek tragedy played a very important yeah, yeah. role in the debate, in the political debate. First, at the time of apartheid, it was Antigone, which was used as a, a tool against apartheid. And while this Commission for Truth and Reconciliation was working, uh, they were also using Eumenides uh, as a, a tool of reflection on the process of reconciliation. So actually, one can see that there is indeed a link between this idea that classical in antiquity is useful for us and its actual application. Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, thank you very passing. much. That's um, a uh, very good uh, observation. Menahem? Um, it was a fascinating talk, and thank you very much. You portrayed amnesty as a good thing and, of course, ridiculed uh, um, the theatrical. Uh, the, aspect of politics, but there's something, I, I, I'd like to push you a little to, to compare and hold those two cases uh, um, next to each other a little, because in both cases there's a suspension of truth, right? A suspension of truth, a deliberate suspension of truth, um, uh, in order to achieve something else which, which is in great tension with truth. In, in the theatrical side, of course, it's, it's, it's obvious, but in amnesty, it's, 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 it's trying to get peace, right? Peace to trump justice or to trump truth. And, and it, 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 there was a tragic turn to, to, to your presentation of amnesty because, because of the failure always in the sense that truth sort of jumps back. To, to, you know, it, it's very, very difficult to, mm -hmm. to, to suspend truth and to put, and something of the same kind of tragedy comedy happens in the theatrical, uh, uh, where, where truth, you know, uh, the theatrics of the politicians are, 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 are transparent. I mean, the, 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 they succeed, but yet they don't succeed because of the hold of truth. 
truth. And I think something in, in both cases, there's a parallel in both cases, which, which, which I think is interesting, if you could enlarge a little. Um, I will only make a very brief remark because I would like to give other people the opportunity also to participate in the discussion. We are, don't have a lot of time, but you are absolutely right uh, about the uh, element uh, of illusion also in um, uh, amnesty, illusion as something being different from uh, reality. And we observe, uh, for instance, in Athens, the effort to rewrite history in order to make amnesty work. Uh, but also the effort to rewrite history after the amnesty has been implemented a few years later, for instance, it is not any longer the commemoration of reconciliation that is important, but the commemoration of the victory of one party over the other. So it's no longer a story of amnesty and reconciliation, but it is a story of victory of the Athenian people, all of them, over the very few, the demonized tyrants. And at the end, you have an entirely different story that is not the story of two groups of citizens fighting against each other, but a group of the entire people being um, <coughs> under the rule of a minority of only 30 persons. And this goes as far as to forget certain events, for instance, the self-sacrifice of a seer in Athens who uh, we know uh, the story, we know where he was buried and so on, and a few generations later, nobody knew about him exactly because the commemoration of his sacrifice, the commemoration of the part he played in the civil war would destroy this picture of the Democrats being the entire Athenian people fighting against a very small minority of tyrants. So this is a fascinating subject of how amnesty and the implementation of amnesty means in a sense also amnesi amnesia, that is the rewriting uh, of history. Please. And then Tony, but first, yeah. I, I guess we all want to talk about amnesty. Um, this was really interesting to me. I had no idea that there were these great practices of amnesty and reconciliation. Um, it, as I understand it, the way you've presented it, it the, Amnesty is, is, is always sort of counterposed to truth and remembering in the, in the Greek practice. And if, that, if that's right, and I don't, know, I don't know if I'm understanding correctly and if that's, if that's accurate, but if it is, there's a remarkable difference between that practice and contemporary practices, in, in, in particular the South African practice, in which amnesty was only given on condition of, of, a, of a full accounting with the past. An individual would only receive amnesty if he or she fully accounted for his or her past actions and it was subject to significant amount of cross-examination, et cetera. And, in, and indeed for the entire country, there was this, just a spectacle for months on end of people in, on the evening news recounting these horrible acts that were done over the course of many years. So it was, it was an attempt, it sounds to me, that was rather different than the Greek case of trying to provide amnesty and reconciliation while really accounting for the past and providing truth about the past. Yeah, there is a difference, uh, and one can see it also in the use of the word, because the word amnesty is used only in relatively late sources. The first references to amnesty in Greece are references to the notion of me mnesikakein, that is not to remember bad things, that is the establishment of a collective memory, uh, of a, a selective memory, not collective, of a selective memory, without accountability forgetting certain things and focusing uh, on others. And the notion, although it is attested only once, of mnesi holain, not to act, remembering in anger, remembering bad, bad things. Tony? Do you hear me? Um, I was really impressed and I would like to come back to our key issue, what's really the relevance now uh, of the Greeks and Romans to our age. And uh, you showed us very nicely and you just brought issues up of your big uh, research on, on emotions. So both uh, topics kind of were linked uh, with emotions. And emotions are certainly universal things, not uh, particular to, to Greek and Romans. So my suggestion would be, and I, I guess you, you, you would agree, what is re really relevant for us nowadays is that the Greeks and Romans in a particular way left us uh, important intellectual thoughts and sources 
and left us uh, uh, rituals and thoughts how you could deal with emotions. And isn't that what is really relevant for us now? Yes, uh, this um, is also um, uh, an important aspect, for instance, of the study of ancient historiography. That is the fact that the Greeks reflect on these problems and uh, in a very, very critical uh, manner and having in mind us. They are not only doing it for themselves. This is the important phrase, for instance, in Thucydides. I'm writing this as a property in eternity as long as human nature is going to produce similar phenomena. This, in a sense, summarizes what you were saying, for instance, about the universality of emotions or the universality of certain, prob um, of certain phenomena. Despite this universality, of course, as a historian, I always stress the fact that things are nevertheless different. Anger in antiquity is not exactly the same as anger today because of social and cultural parameters that need to be taken into consideration. But what the value of the Greek paradigm is not to teach us how to behave, but to make us more conscious and more sensitive towards a critical view of phenomena that otherwise might remain unobserved. Other? Yes, please. Thank you very much for a very excellent uh, talk. Uh, would it be fair to say in your mind that the uh, Greeks had a very, very sophisticated understanding of what we would, might consider the modern political process? Um, I am always hesitant to use the word the Greeks. Uh, all right, all <laughs> I right. would say certain Greeks, uh, especially in... Yeah, uh, not only Athenians, uh, Polybius, for instance, is another case of someone who is also reflective and very conscious of certain uh, events, but it is Greeks under certain conditions with certain education and very often uh, Greeks who have suffered. That is, it is the process of suffering, the process of being confronted with extreme crises that creates this sensitive and um, uh, the sensitivity and reflection on uh, political processes. It, we, interestingly, we only find uh, these remarks after great disasters, great wars, occupation, civil war, and so on. Uh, and this is also the tragedy of historians, that they always try to explain that some of this can be avoided if we only look at what happened uh, in the past. And, this, uh, and we only notice that uh, this, doesn't, um, uh, this doesn't happen. On the other hand, the Greek experience is part of the general human experience, which can always be some uh, food of uh, thought. I always avoid to uh, focus, uh, to uh, highlight uh, any uh, normative value of the Greeks and so on. But on the other hand, they have left extremely valuable texts, literature. If it is important, for instance, to learn Greek, it is not because, as I said before, our IQ is going to increase, but because there are such a wonderful texts. There's uh, reason enough to learn ancient Greek only to read Homer and to see that it is in the original. But you know, just listening very carefully to your excellent uh, talk, it would seem that a modern politician could likely learn most of his trade by reading these Greek, these Greek texts. Well, some politicians translated these texts. For instance, Eleftherios Venizelos, who was the greatest uh, statesman in Greece in the, 20th, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, translated Thucydides. And this was something that uh, was more common in the 19th century or in the early uh, 20th century that it is, uh, than it is uh, nowadays. And this is uh, uh, something that has to do with uh, education and priorities given in education. Thank you. I'm afraid that we have to stop here. Thank you very much, also in the name of Danielle, for your interest. <laughs>